الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين الحمد لله all praises are for Allah azza wa jal all praises are for Allah who has blessed us in many different ways we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity to be in this blessed gathering so that we can teach and learn the sacred and the perfected way of life that Allah has given to us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very kind and merciful to his servants but the servants at times do not recognize that Allah himself says in the Quran certainly he Allah is dhu fadlin ala an-nas he is full of grace to people he continues to bless them in many different ways giving them one thing after the other as Allah himself says in the holy Quran that we have given you every single thing you have asked for everything you have asked for let's look at the life of a human being let us look at ourselves at different points in time we need different things and the needs we have they vary from each other today as a young man who have finished schooling you want to work allah gives you a work then you begin to work you want to be married allah gives you a spouse alhamdulillah when you are married you want a place to put your spouse you want a house allah gives you a house when both of you are living you want children now allah gives you children when you have children you want to save for your children for their education for their schooling allah gives you that with the increase of responsibility allah gives you an increase in wealth sometimes allahu akbar this is allah's qadr sometimes a man is alone he says how can i take care of a wife when he becomes married he can take care of a wife now and when he is married now with his wife and they are thinking about whether they should have children or not they are speaking about we don't have sufficient to feed the children if we have a child milk and pampers and all these things when allah gives you a child you find the means to look after your child and you get more than one and another one and another one and every time you get there is an increase in your wealth and in your salary and whatever it is because allah will take care of everybody and when you have children now and everything is going good you want grandchildren now subhanallah you want to have a good son in law for your daughter and you want to have a good daughter in law for your son that's the desire allah gives you that also when we become old we want to live more a man reaches 50 years and when there is a little shukrana everybody is saying we wish he could live another 50 years as if nobody wants to die when you reach 100 there is the desire to live even another 50 years allahu akbar the thing about it my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truthful when he says we have given you everything you ask for everything whatever you want allah says we have given that to you but mankind does not become grateful to allah mankind doesn't become grateful to allah he forgets his lord he forgets everything about worshiping about being obedient to allah he conducts his life in a manner that he doesn't care about anything as we say in our language in a dokida manner he forgets allah he does not worship allah he does not perform his salah he does not do his duties to allah 
And then one day Allah wants to teach him a lesson and he becomes sick. He gets into a serious accident. Something bad happens to him. And while he is undergoing this great trial and difficulty, he says, oh Allah, please help me. Allah helps him and he comes out from that. See how gracious Allah is. How gracious. But he says, but man is ungrateful. And man cannot understand what he is doing. And in whatever he is doing, he is bringing destruction to his own self. If a man, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, if a man decides to worship Allah, that doesn't do Allah any good. And if he decides to reject Allah, that doesn't do Allah any bad. The good and the bad comes to the individual himself. So this is why, my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, the reason I have highlighted this point is that to be in a gathering wherein Allah and His Messenger, they are mentioned is one of the most auspicious and blessed gathering. The Sahih Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed angels on the face of the earth. The only maqsad and purpose of these angels is to roam about at the different places to see where there are gatherings in which Allah is mentioned. Where are those gatherings in which deen, Islam is mentioned? Where are those gatherings in which mention of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being made? These angels roam about searching for those and when they find it, they come and they sit and they report, they, they give that report to Allah that we have gone to this place and these people are engaged in many different activities of deen. These people are mentioned about deen. In today's world, this is the weekend night. Where do you find many people in our country? Where do you find many Muslims now? Where are those people? Is it that they do not need the deen of Allah? Is it that they do not know, they do not need to know about the deen of Allah? Is it that they are ulama and allama? They know everything? That they have no need to learn anything more? No, they have a lot of need. And they know about cases and they know about bayans and they know about lectures that are being held in different places. For what? When an alim comes to lecture, does he speak about politics? When an alim and a scholar comes to lecture, does he beg the people for money and food? No, na'uzu billah. This is not the case. They come to teach and come to spread the message of deen. This is why they come. They come to teach people Islam. They come to learn also because by speaking they learn. By speaking their iman grows up also. Ikhlas comes in because they are the first hearer, hearer of what they are saying. Their heart is closer to their mouth than the hearts of the other people. So whatever is uttered, it, whatever is uttered passes their heart first. This is the effort of the deen of Allah. This is the effort. And this brings us to the topic of discussion. Based on what we see around us. Based on what we see from the conduct and attitude of many people. And we reflect on the beautiful tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We will realize Allahu Akbar. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was truly inspired by Allah of the occurrences that will come on the face of the earth. In a hadith that has been recorded by Imam Bayhaqi, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, an ala nasi zaman. He says, very soon a time will appear before man. La yabaqa min al-islami illa rasmahu, illa ismahu. Nothing of Islam will remain except the name. Subhanallah. La yabaqa min al-islam illa ismahu. Nothing will remain of Islam except a name. Only a name that is being heard. The greatness of the religion of Allah is only known to be Islam. When at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the greatness was also attributed to the followers of Islam. But the Prophet ﷺ said, only the name will remain. 
ولا يبقى من القرآن إلا رسمه. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and nothing will remain of the Quran except only the words that you see, only the rasum, the rasam, the letters, the nazam, the arrangement that people are reading again and again. It doesn't have any benefit. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, soon there will be reciters of the Quran that they will recite the Quran, that Quran which is so powerful. And it is so great that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَ هَذَا الْقُرْعَانَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلْ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا You will see if this Qur'an was revealed on a mountain, you will see this mountain shattering the pieces out of the fear of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the believers in the Qur'an. It says, Allah says about the believers, what is the quality of the believer? What is the conduct of a believer? He says, وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا That whenever the Qur'an is recited to them, their iman goes up. Subhanallah. Their iman increases. Tears come out from their eyes out of the fear of Allah that comes from the Qur'an. From the Qur'an. Allahu Akbar. This is why you will find that the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum Sometimes when they begin to read the Qur'an, they cannot pass one ayah of the Qur'an. They will read it. They will weep. They will read that same ayah again until they fall unconscious, just pondering over that ayah. Over one ayah of the Qur'an. This is the power of the Qur'an. Subhanallah. But then, what does the Prophet ﷺ say? The attitude and the conduct of the people will be such that they will be far away from the Qur'an. What the Qur'an mentions and what is in their life are two separate things. Zameen, asman, kafarat. Difference between the heavens and the earth, the skies and the earth. What is there is something else and what is might be in their lives, it is something else. People have become strangers to the Holy Qur'an. Which people? Cannot be the non-Muslims because they have nothing to do with the Qur'an. They have nothing to do with the Qur'an. Muslims, their holy book is the Qur'an. They believe it is the final revelation. They believe that this Qur'an is their guide and this is the form of their guidance. They believe that success lies in following this Qur'an. They believe that. Other people do not believe that. But when Muslims themselves become strangers to the Qur'an, then those who are non-Muslims will use the opportunity to condemn, to criticize, to tear up, to burn the Qur'an. Because the protectors of the Qur'an are not to be seen. If you leave your house deserted, you will see many thieves. You will see robbers. You will see people pelting stones and throwing stones. You will see those people who are on drugs, they will come and lime in your house because you are not there again. You will see the roof rotting apart. You will see cobweb all over the house. You will see the galvanized becoming rusted because there is no protector again. So when we have been made the people in whose hands and in whose hearts the Quran have come and we turn away from it and we cast it aside, then who will be the protectors of the Quran on the face of the earth to argue for it, to defend it, to hold it to their bosom and say you can't do anything to this book. I'll give my life before you do anything to this book. This is why on the day of judgment, the Holy Quran itself says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, Ya Rabbi, O oh my Lord, O oh my Allah, my people, they have turned against this Quran. They have left alone the Quran. They have taken this Quran, mahjura, they have by leaving it alone. They will complain to Allah on the day of judgment. He will say, O oh Allah, my people, I gave them the Quran, but they left it alone. So this same Quran, which is our guide, which is what is right before us, it is like subhanallah. It is a door that is open, and that door is filled with light. And there is someone over the door, calling us towards that door. Enter this door. Enter this door. As the hadith of the Prophet says, but while you are going towards that door, there is a door on your right, there is a door on your left. There is another small door. There is another small door. And before you could reach that big door, 
where there is light in it and someone is calling you, there are many doors on the side. Every time you pass and every time you take a footstep, somebody in that door is calling you towards it. You make another footstep, one on the left side of that door is calling you towards it. The Prophet ﷺ said, the big large door you see in front, that is the door towards the Qur'an to Allah. The caller to that door is myself. I have been sent to call you to the door. But all these small doors that you have to pass are the doors where shaitan is calling you. Every footstep you take, Satan is trying to tempt you. Satan is pulling you here. He's pulling you there. And he wants to distract you from going to that right place. So sometimes people do not get the opportunity to reach there. They fall aside and they go inside the door and they are lost forever. They have lost their direction. They have lost their focus on life. And that's it for them. Subhanallah, may Allah protect us from that. So the Prophet ﷺ says, that Quran which came from Allah, people will take it in such a manner that only the words of the Quran will be there. People will take it in such a manner that only the words will be recited in the most beautiful way. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, it will not even pass going down to their heart. It will be recited in the best possible manner, but it will not even go to the heart. Subhanallah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, that time will come. لا يبقى من من القرآن إلا رسمه that the Quran will only be pages. It will only be the Arabic script. The guidance will not be achieved from it. People don't practice upon it. It will just be there in a book that when you want to get the blessings, you read it. When you want to, to send the blessings, you read it. But there is nothing about getting guidance from it and following it. The Quran has become something which is a formal book now. Used for special occasions. The Prophet ﷺ said, he said also that time will come. The time will come. Where he said, Masajiduhum Amira. Masjids will be very big. Masjids will be built in a very beautiful manner. A very beautiful manner. Masajiduhum Amira. Big, huge, lofty, beautiful. But it will be empty of guidance, subhanallah. Empty of guidance. Mind their respected brothers and mind their sisters. You know very well that in many of our masajids, there is hardly anyone to come there for salat. Hardly anyone. In many of our masajid, look at the population of Muslims living in the locality and look to see how much attend the masjid. It's an insignificant amount. You might find in a locality about 500 males. For Fajr, you have three people. Allahu Akbar. For Fajr. Everybody gets up in the morning to go to work. Three people. For Dhuhr Salat, you might have a little more than that. For Asr Salat, you may have a little more than that. For Maghrib, you will have probably a little more than that. And for Isha, it decreases again because everybody, they are taking their dinner and they are looking at the news. Huh? This is why the Prophet says, Masajid will be built, but empty of guidance. It will be empty. Not only it will be, it will be empty, but another thing the Prophet ﷺ told us. He says, لا تقوم ساعتو, The hour of judgment will not come. حتى يتباه الناس بالمساجد Until people will begin to boast about their masjids. Allahu Akbar. In other words, people will compete with each other in saying whose masjid is better than whose? Whose masjid is bigger than whose? Which one is more beautiful? That will be the maqsad of building a masjid. Sometimes there is a need for a masjid in an area. People are gathering. People are coming together to decide. And you know the, the requirement. What is needed is a place, a good place. That is comfortable for the people to come to the masjid and perform salat with peace and tranquility. That is what is needed. 
to join people with Allah, to join the makhluk with the khalik, the creation with the creator. But then you hear people giving their advice and they, make, they are making statements, we want to have the best masjid in Trinidad. When people see it, they must open their eyes and say, wow, that is the best. Exactly as the Prophet said. There was once upon a time that they did not even have masjid on the face of the earth. The Prophet wasallam's own masjid was built with mud walls, unbaked brick. It was, there was absolutely sometimes no mortar on it. The roof was just above the head. The roof of the masjid was with dead palm leaves that when rain fell, it will pass through. It will, it will go on the ground and when they made sajda, the mud and the dirt will show up on their face. That was the Prophet wasallam masjid. No musalla, no carpet. The bare sand like that. The bare sand. But this masjid, this masjid was the best masjid on the face of the earth after the Haram Sharif. And that small place there, which has become big now, Allahu Akbar, when you perform one salat there, you get thousands and thousands and thousands of blessings. That small place there. A masjid, a jamaat is the people, not the building. We must understand that. It is the people. There is no sense in boasting about your masjid if guidance is not there. If people are not attending the masjid, if people are not benefiting from the masjid, if people are not rendering services in the masjid, the masjid, in fact, that will be a burden for the Muslims of that community. Remember very well, my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, many people do not take note of this. But whenever the Muslims of a locality build a masjid, it's their, it is their responsibility to upkeep that masjid. It is their responsibility to attend that masjid. It is their responsibility to teach Islam in that masjid. If they do not do that, all of them will be accountable to Allah. All of them. So if a masjid is such that no one comes for Fajr Salah, and the door remains locked, and no one comes for Dhuhr Salah, and no one comes for the other Salat, all the Muslims, especially the males, who supposed to be there, they will be accountable to Allah on the day of judgment. This is their responsibility. A masjid is not a museum you build and you leave it open. Like that. It's not a bare room. There is a maqsad of building a masjid. And the maqsad is that you have to frequent the masjid. You have to frequent the masjid. You have to take care of the masjid. So much so, that even in the matters of i'tikaf, when the month of Ramadan comes in, and the last 10 days come, when the last 10 days come, if nobody from among the males decide to make i'tikaf in that masjid, all the males are accountable to Allah. Because it is the haq and the right of the masjid upon the Muslims that they, somebody must stay in that masjid for i'tikaf. That's the haq and the right of the masjid. So, with all of these things being mentioned, which we know about, in the traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, "A time will come, la taqoomu saatu hatta yatabah nasu bil masajid, that a time, the hour of judgment will not come until people begin to boast about their masajid. Masjid will just be about boasting, which one is bigger and better than the other one." And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the other hadith which we have quoted. Masajiduhum amiratun. Masjids will be big, huge, lofty. Wahiya kharabu min al huda, but empty of guidance. No iman. Hardly anybody. So we must pay attention to these things because the Prophet wasallam was given a great amount of knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is Allahu Akbar. It is a great favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself would say at times that many prophets were told about certain things that will appear. But Allah has given me such knowledge about what will really appear that no other prophet was given such knowledge. And this is why there are so many things mentioned about the signs of the hour of judgment. As Muslims we believe very well. We believe 
that the world will not go on forever and ever. There is the time of destruction. There is the time of resurrection. There is a time for judgment. There is a time when the world will end and there will be a time when the world will come back again but in a different form. The resurrection, the hereafter and we believe that. And because of what is happening, our scholars have stated, many of our scholars were deep inside who can look and think and ponder. They have stated that many of the signs which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which he has mentioned many of these signs are right before us. Many of these signs are right before us in one of the beautiful traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, يُشَكُلْ أُمَّمُ أَن تَدَاعَ عَلَيْكُمْ كَمَا تَدَاعَ الْأَكَلُ تُئِأَكَلَكْتُ إِلَى قَصَعَتِهَا He says very soon, very soon it will happen that all the other nations will surround you will surround you. They will come to you from all sides, just as people who are eaten from a dish surround the dish. If there is one big basin or a big plate and you have 10 people to eat from it, where will they go? One behind the other, they will surround the plate. The Prophet ﷺ said, a time is coming where all the other nations will surround you in the same way. In the right, left, front and behind, all of them will surround you. So, one companion said, it is amazing. Why will people surround? Obviously, they will surround to attack you. They will surround you to destroy you. So, they will come in all directions. So, one person said, فَقَالَ قَائِلٌ A person from among them said, وَمِنْ قِلَّةٍ نَحْنُ يَوْمَ O Prophet of Allah, would this surround us because of the fact that we'll, we will be in the minority? We will be in a small number? And obviously we can logically understand that if you have a, a small group of people, and opposite to that there is a large group of people, then the large group can surround a small group from all directions and all sides. So the person said, O Messenger of Allah, would that happen because... We will be in a small amount. We the Muslims will be a small amount. Based on this narration, we know there have been many cases like that. Isn't that so? The Muslims in the middle and in every direction, there is an opposing power. Someone wants to shoot you. Someone wants to bomb you. Someone wants to kill you. Someone wants to do something. Someone wants to destroy you. Someone wants to take your wealth. This is what is happening in today's world. From all sides. There, is there are attacks from every direction. We are in the middle. And we know that very well. We are in the middle and everybody is pointing fingers now. And they are writing books and throwing slangs and sending, sending people to investigate us. Hear what they are saying. See where they are going. Subhanallah. That's a reality. You can't escape that. Like if everybody is coming down on your throat. That's how it occurs. If you travel to a Caribbean island, it's the same problem. If you go to another country, that's the same problem. Wherever you go, you go to a place, you get a stamp because you wanted to go there, that's a problem in the whole world now. Subhanallah. Exactly as the Prophet ﷺ said. And he spoke when Islam was rising to glory. When Islam was going up and up and up, that's the time he spoke. He says, no, it will climb down. It will come down. So the Sahabi said, O Messenger of Allah, would this happen because of the fact that we will be a small amount? The Prophet ﷺ says, Bal antum yawma idhin kathirun. No, no, no. But at that time you will be a large amount. Allahu Akbar. You will be a huge amount. You will be in the majority also. You will be a big group. As you know, Muslims normally boast. Islam is the fastest growing religion on the face of the earth. Huh? Islam, this is what is said again and again. For every one person who accepts another religion, ten people accept Islam. Statistics, it is there. Islam is growing like wildfire in the West. Islam is moving. Where are the Muslims if Islam is moving? 
Where is the power of the Muslims? Subhanallah. How it is that when we see Muslims in this country, you know, being attacked and bombed up and, and bombed up and whatever it is, you have all these other non-Muslim countries taking people. Come here and live. We understand your situation. Come here and live. We understand your situation. But nobody from the Muslim country says, come here and live. We don't see that. Everybody on the international news, you will see which country is given how much to that country. People are suffering. Flood, earthquake, destruction. But you don't see Muslim countries, how much they are given. You don't see anything. Is it only about sadaqah and zakat you have to give? In the whole year, the only thing you give to your neighbor is kurbani meat? What about the other days he's starving? And kurbani meat, you give him so much as if it's for the whole year also. Because you tell yourself, I can't eat a whole cow by myself. What you'll do? No. The purpose and the maqsad of giving these things and sadaqat and khairat, it's to build in our heart the love for charity. That every single time there is a reason to give, you give. You may have given all your zakat already, but there is a need. Your love for that person, love to give, makes you give. Say, so don't worry, I have given, but inshallah I'll get more blessings. That's, that's the way Islam tre- you know, has, has trained us. That's the way Islam has trained us. So therefore, the Prophet ﷺ said, you, he's telling the Sahabi, the companion, it's a lesson for all of us, you will be in great amount. Big crowds you will be in. But how would you be? How would you be? وَلَكِنَّكُمْ غُثَاءٌ كَغُثَاءِ السَّيْلِ But you will be like the froth of the froths of the flood water. That's how you will be. You will be like the froth of the froth of the floods, wo- the flood waters. That's what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. This is how you will be. Now look at the similarity and the similitude that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given. We know froth. Something makes froth on the water. What what is the nature of that froth? There are two things about the froth. One is that. Whichever direction the wind blows in, the froth is going to go in that direction. It doesn't have any power to withstand and stay one place. Isn't that so? And no matter, there might be big bubbles and a lot of froth. The entire top is frothy. You put your hand there, it's broken down. You put your hand, just one finger you put and everything goes down. Ah, we understand what the prophet is saying now. You will be like froth. You will be in great amount, but you will be powerless. You will be weak. You will have a voice. Nobody will fear you. Nobody will be worried about you. Nobody would even think about what you can do to them because you will be like the froth on the water. You will go in any direction. They throw you and kick you. You will go there. They come to there and say, Muslims of this country, all of you have to shave your beard. We say, Sami'na wa ta'na, we hear and we obey. In order to come to our country, you have to change your Muslim name. We say, Sami'na wa ta'na, we hear and we obey. Just allow us to enter, that's it. We'll be weak, no power, no strength to remain firm on the iman which Allah has given us. That's what the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, you will be like fraught. Going in any direction, the wind blows. Whichever direction the force pushes you, you're going to go in that direction. And just a little hard word, you are frightened. Like a little touch and the fraud goes out. One little harsh word. We'll do this if you don't. Okay, okay. I'll do it. Anything you say. This is what the Prophet ﷺ says. There was once upon a time, during the time of the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala. And the times afterwards, the Muslims commanded such respect that all the surrounding territories, the people of Rome, the people of Persia, all the surrounding territories, they just heard that the Muslims were coming to preach Islam at they started to tremble like leaves. They started to tremble like leaves. When the Muslims were going into some parts of Persia and on that direction, the people there, just in order that the Muslims should not enter, they broke down the bridge. They broke down the bridge. The Amir 
of the Muslim army and the group came by the bridge. Thinking now, how are we going to reach to this place and we have to reach the message of Islam? He raised his hands and made dua to Allah. And then he said, we are in the path of Allah. Let your horses go into the water. Everybody, they were fully obedient. They just pat the horses and ask those, move in the water. All the horses move into the water, but cross the water, walked on the water, ran on the water and reached on the other side. Allahu Akbar. When the people of that territory saw them, they say, Allah. They couldn't imagine. Say, these are not human beings. These are some other creatures. They left and they ran away from their place. And that entire territory came into Islam and there was no fighting. And one after the other, wherever the Muslims went, there was this realm. And this is what Allah says in the Quran. Sa'ulqi fi bihim rab At the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet, you do what you have to do, take my message forth, and I will put and instill fear in their hearts. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one of the gifts that Allah has given to me, is that the fear is created in the hearts for those who oppose me, to the distance of one month's journey. In other words, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is going to undertake a journey, today from a certain place, so let's understand that, and it will take him a month Traveling every day to reach a place. From the time he started the journey, the fear in the hearts of those people living a month away, it starts to come in. They tremble. They say, oh, what's happening? That was the nature of the fear. Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and when he, people simply heard his name, they used to become fearful. This is how Allah blessed the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Muslims always, always, wherever they went, it was in this way. That on one hand you had 40,000 and the Muslims just, they were 3,000. Huh? 3,000. On some hand, you know in the case with the, the battle against the Roman Emperor, Heracle, Hercules, they were about two or 300,000 on one side. Muslims had about 30,000 for the most. <laughs> but Allahu Akbar, they couldn't see that figure. They saw the people in front just like themselves and they just do what they had to do. They went to propagate Islam and those people who became obstacles, they had to remove the obstacles and they went forth. That was it. Bismillah and they went. No fear in their hearts. When the Sahabi went to meet Rustam, the Iranian leader, Rustam, normally it is that the people, whenever they enter the kingdom and the palace of a king, first of all you bow. And you wait. Hmm? You wait until you are called. And in these big places, we know you have to go in this office. And then they will tell you, sit. And then they will call you. You will go in another office. You will meet another person. He will check you. And then finally, after a lot of time, you will meet the big, the big boy, as we say. Same way. These big kings rule in this manner. So when that Sahabi went to give the message to Rustam, who was the Iranian leader, to tell him what we are coming for, to teach and preach Islam. He rode on his horse. He entered into the kingdom on his horse. The horse trampled on the red carpet. And he stood right in front of the king. Everybody became upset. He didn't bow before the king. He didn't show worship to the king. And he had his spear in his hand. And he was digging up the carpet. The most expensive red carpet. That carpet was so expensive when, when Iran came into Islam, they distributed in booty the mal of Malighanima, the booty spoils of war. The Sahabis, each of them, get a small piece of cap, that red carpet, a small piece. And that small piece fetched thousands of gold coins, one small piece. Thousands of gold coins, so expensive. And he started to use a spear, piercing it. Everybody became angry, started to complain to him. He said, We fear Allah alone. I have come here to deliver a message to you. And he placed his message and he walked out. Fearless. There was no fear for others. Because once the fear of Allah comes in the heart of a person, no other fear can come in that heart. Understand that. Once the fear of Allah enters into the heart of a person, no other fear can come in the heart. No other fear. And once there is no fear of Allah in the heart, all the other fears will come in. 
the fear of this, the fear of that, the fear of the other thing, the fear of poverty, the fear of death, all the other fears. So that fear is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in the hearts of the, the, the unbelievers and the non-Muslims for the Muslims. That was always there. The Muslims walked fearlessly. Wherever it was in the territories of the non-Muslims, they walked. People, 10, 15 different people came to attack them. They would just move fearlessly because Allah was in their heart. The fear of Allah was in their heart. That's, they were, were not bothered and worried because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed fear in the hearts of the other people for these people. And as long as we walk on that path, then this is what Allah will continue to do. We wouldn't fear other people. Once we fear Allah, other people will begin to fear other people. It's a truth. Not a fear that you're going to harm them, but the fear that, listen, let me not do anything to this Muslim brother or this Muslim sister. Allah creates that. But what will happen when the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ But you will be. غُثَاءٌ كَغُثَاءِ السَّيْلِ You will be like the froth, like the froth on the flood water. What will happen at that time? Why we will be so powerless? Why would the Muslims be at that time so weak? The Prophet ﷺ says, وَلَا يَنزَعَنَّ اللَّهُ مِن صُدُورِ عَدُوِّكُمَ الْهَبَّةِ Because Allah will take away the fear that your enemies had in their heart for you, that was in their hearts, Allah will take that fear away. They wouldn't fear you anymore. That is what Allah will do. Allah will take out that fear. You will become fearful and they will become fearless. That is the result of that. That is what will happen. They wouldn't be fearful of you anymore. They wouldn't think about who you are and what religion you belong to. They would not even look at your history in the past. They see what victory and honor granted the Muslims. You will be nothing. The Prophet is saying, you wouldn't have any name, you wouldn't have any fame, nothing. Because the fear that they had in their hearts... Allah will take that away. They will feel a sense of strength now and power. That we rule, we can do everything. So Allah will take away from their hearts this that is called al habba That fear which was in their hearts. From the time of the Prophet wasallam, And what will Allah put in your heart? Allah will take out something from their hearts. And Allah will put something in your hearts. What will Allah put in your hands? وَلَا يَقْذِفَنَّ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ الْوَهَن Allah will put wahan in your heart. Allah will put wahan in your heart. فَقَالَ قَائِلٌ So one person, a sahabi who was there, he said, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ مَا الْوَهَن O Rasool Allah, O Messenger of Allah, what is this wahan about? Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling us that you will you will begin to be scared of others. You will fear them. They speak loud, you're ready to cry. They talk loud, you're ready to leave your country and your home and everything. You are so scared that will happen. But how can we be scared? How can we be scared when we have Allah on our side? Allah is the most powerful. Allah is the greatest. Allah controls the heavens and the earth. Whoever has Allah on their side, how can that person fear? You know, it's just like you, you, you are scared to walk down the road. Let's say you are scared to walk down the road. And there is this big bajon as we say. Everybody fears him. You know, he is well equipped with all this armor. He says, don't worry, let's walk down the road. Nobody can do you anything. No, you feel good. Huh? Isn't that so? The fear goes from your heart. You walk, relax. And he reaches you at home. You say, no, go safe. No problem. You feel that sense of comfort. That peace, security. No, no fear in your heart. Why? Because you had somebody at your side who was strong and powerful. That's why. And when we have Allah on our side... We worship Allah five times a day. We raise our hands in dua, begging Allah, praising Allah, glorifying Allah. Allah is on our side. Allahu waliyul ladina amanu. Allah is the protector and the friend of the believers. How can we cower? We can be cowards. 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make dua to Allah and say, "Oh Allah, I, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. A cowardice shouldn't come in the heart of a, a believer, because Allah's love is there. He recognizes who Allah is." But then what will happen is that when the fear comes out from the heart of the people for you, Allah will instill wahan. So therefore when we find ourselves in a situation like that, fearing what this person will say, fearing what that person will say, fearing what they're going to do, if they're going to do, and uh, we live like this, we have to recognize that something has come in our heart. And that thing which has entered our heart is called al-wahan. And what is al-wahan? Allahu Akbar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was asked about what is wahan, he said, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا وَقَرَاهِيَةُ الْمَوْتِ Two things is wahan. Two things. They are wahan. حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا Your love for the world. Your love for the world and your dislike for death. And whenever these things come in the heart of a believer, he must become scared and frightened. He loves the world so much, he doesn't want the world to depart from him. He loves the world so much, he cannot give up any part of it. He loves the world so much, he will do everything for it. He will run behind it. He will break the laws of Allah for it. He is hearing, this is haram, this is haram. He says, no, I see, I want to make money. I, I want to build a big house. I want to do, I have installments to pay. I have a mortgage to pay. I have to make money. When I die, we'll see about that halal haram thing. That's what people say. When I die, we'll see about that. So a person is breaking Allah's law because of the love of the world. And when there is love for the world, we kill ourselves behind the world so we don't have any time to stand before Allah. We work day and night. We work day and night. There isn't any time to spend in the masjid, the house of Allah. There isn't any time to spend propagating the deen of Allah. There isn't any strength in our body to get up for a few rakats of tahajjud in the morning. Even to get a few minutes in the morning after Fajr to open the Quran and recite it, we don't have that time because we have worked ourselves night and day. We become so tired that we can't even spend a few moments for the sake of Allah. The love of the world is taking us far away from Allah. How can we get Allah's help? And the other thing is karahiyatul maut. We fear that so much that anytime a person says, if you do that, I'll kill you, we begin to tremble. How can we fear that? What is today, tomorrow, or next 100 years? We have to die, isn't that so? We have to die. We didn't come here to live forever. So in whatever way Allah chooses to take us, we must be ready to go. But when man fears death, he is going to run away from every such thing that he feels threatens his life. He will run away from it. He will run away from it. The Prophet ﷺ said, because of these two things, because of these two things, you will become weak. You won't have any power in you. One, your love for the world makes you far away from Allah. As the Prophet ﷺ said, the heart of a human being is only one. We don't have two hearts. The heart of a human being is one. And that one heart is such a container that cannot take two opposite things at the same time. If there is light in your heart, there can't be darkness. And if there is darkness in your heart, there can't be light. They are two opposite. Similarly, the love of the world is opposite to the love of Allah. The love of Allah is opposite to love of the world. Your heart cannot have these two things. You can't have love for Allah and love for the world at the same time in your heart. You can't do that. The, because the heart is only one. It's a receptacle like that. So if there is love for the world in the heart, it means there is no love for Allah in that heart. And if there is love for Allah in the heart, it means Alhamdulillah, that's a good sign there is no love for the world. Love for the world doesn't mean that we give up eats and drinks and we give up whatever Allah has given us from comfort. No, we use it, but we use it to get closer to Allah. We work hard to feed ourselves, our family members, those who are dependent upon us to live a comfortable life, but not forgetting that five times a day we have to perform salat. We must give zakat. We must give sadaqat. We must give khairat. We must observe the fast. We must sit and spend time in the deen of Allah. We cannot let 
the love of the world take us away from this our duty this is our duty so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us about that he told us also about protecting our deen protecting our deen is the most important thing we are muslims yes but if we don't check ourselves and we begin to to do things that a muslim not supposed to do we're going to lose our deen and whatever we do it's based on the knowledge we have about that isn't that so this is why the sahabas used to say that the knowledge you have about your deen is your deen itself because whatever you know that's how you're going to practice let's say you learn from a person sometime in life that zuhr salat has three farz not four what will you do three or four three that's what you learn and if you learn that in the maghrib salat there are four farz not three what are you going to do perform four until one good day you seek knowledge or somebody tells you they say performing salat say brother maghrib is three say no 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 i learned four say no brother it's three he says show me in the quran where there is three the whole ummah the whole world knows that's for us in the hadith of the prophet you are performing for no, the, the point i'm making is that what you know the knowledge you have about something is what you are going to practice so your knowledge is your practice your knowledge is your religion if you know a wrong thing is right you're going to do it always be thinking it is right that is how it is so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam based on his teachings the sahabas used to say since your knowledge is your deen and what you practice look to see who you are taking your knowledge from because if you take your knowledge from people who can cause you to be misguided and deviated you shall be misguided and deviated but if you take knowledge from those people who can guide you on the correct path keep you on the correct path inshallah you will read the required destination to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your actions will be good your knowledge about islam will be good your practices will be good your ideologies will be good everything what is supposed to be correct in islam you would know that when we take knowledge from the proper people and what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say he said yakunu fi akhir zaman let's listen to the careful, carefully Listen carefully to what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said on the same topic of knowledge and taking our rulings or guidelines from people. He said, "Yakunu fi akhir zaman dajaluna kathabuna." He says, "There shall be at the end of times, at the end of the world, there shall be liars, false bearers. They will teach you false things. They will preach false false things." they will propagate false false things kadhabun liars dajjal a dajjal is called a dajjal because he hides his true identity that is why a dajjal is called a dajjal this is why the dajjal the antichrist will be called dajjal because being a false person he will claim to be jesus isa alayhi salam so he is hiding his identity to deceive people So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said <coughs> before the hour of judgment 30 dajjal will come 30 false bearers each one of them will be claiming that they are a prophet or a messenger of Allah many So he said in this hadith yakunu fi akhir zaman at the end of times which is a sign of the hour of judgment what will happen there will be dajjaluna kadhabuna liars false bearers who will come about ya'tunakum bil ahadith they will bring such narrations and speeches to you they will come they will tell you this is it this is this is the case they will narrate hadith to you such hadith ma lam tasma'unakum an ma lam tasma'unakum antum wala abaukum such ahadith such narrations such speeches about islam that you and your parents and the predecessors have never heard it. you have never heard about those things they will bring that to you 
Nobody else knows about that. Such speech, explanation, preaching and teaching is not to be found from anybody from among the early centuries of Islam coming straight down. It's not there. But they will teach it to you. They will teach it to you. What did the Prophet ﷺ says? فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ You be careful and beware of such people. You be careful. Because Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ O believers, you are responsible for your iman. When Allah has given you iman, you are responsible to protect it and preserve it. You can't destroy it. So we have to do the things so that it will be preserved. And it will always be protected. Like you have a valuable thing, you have wealth, you have a piece of gold, are you going to throw it all over in the drain to destroy it? No. You will protect it with your life. So we have iman and Islam, we have to protect it and preserve it. And it's protected and preserved based on the knowledge we have of it. So the Prophet ﷺ said, You beware. فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ You beware. Beware. And protect yourself from such people. لَا يُظِلُّونَكُمْ وَلَا يَفْتَنُونَكُمْ let them not misguide you and let them not put you into mischief and confusion. Beware. That's a very beautiful lesson. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, record it's mentioned in Mishkan. He said once to one Sahabi, once the Prophet ﷺ gave a long lecture. After that, in that lecture, the Sahaba started to weep profusely. After that, one Sahabi companion came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he says, "Ya Rasulullah, kanahu mawigatun muwadda'ah." O Prophet of Allah, it seems that this is a farewell address. It seems that you will not be long with us again. This is like a, a goodbye sermon. So, O Prophet of Allah, I beg you to give me a lasting advice. If you are going. Give me a lasting advice that I can keep. The Prophet ﷺ told him, I advise you to fear Allah. And I advise you to listen and obey. That's what you ought to, ought to do. Listen and obey the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. And when people are placed as Amir and leaders over you, listen and obey as long as they are on the path of Islam and they are on the path of truth. This is why he said, وَإِن تَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ حَبْشِيٌ Even though an Abyssinian slave is made your Amir and leader, listen and obey. Most of the problems, this unity and this harmony that we have is because of our Muslims, we all, we fail to listen and obey. If a person says something, it is right, but we don't like it, we say, forget about it, we go and build your own masjid, yes, we'll do our own thing. That's, that's, that's. Let's do, we make our own thing and then when they make their own thing, somebody also doesn't like what is going on, he goes and builds his own thing now. And that is what is happening throughout the whole world. Why that is happening? Because people are failing to listen and obey. People don't have regards for an Amir and the position of an Amir in the sight of Allah. A leader is chosen. Why would the people choose a leader? To walk on him? To listen to him, isn't that so? That's why we choose a leader. So therefore, the Prophet ﷺ told him, listen and obey and do not leave that part at all. Then he said, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا For certainly those of you who live after me, you shall see a lot of disunity. You will see a lot of disunity. Differences. Everybody have their own party. Everybody is saying something else. It's not so. That is what we have in the world today. Everybody is condemning the other one. How are we going to know which one to take and how are we going to know which one to follow? This is what people, people come and they say, Sahib, everybody is saying something else. I don't have any, I don't know what to do. Well, what to do the Rasul already told us. There is no reason to invent an answer for that. And this hadith is a powerful hadith about that. Because he was telling the companion, you shall see a lot of disunity. 
You shall see a lot of this harmony. You will see small factions all over the place. What should you do as a Muslim? فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِرِينَ That is the answer, my dear respected brothers and sisters. The Prophet say, all you have to do, you hold fast on the mind sunnah and the part of mind sahabas, especially the four khalifas. You can't go wrong with that. Because they were the most guided and the Rasul was the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can we ever go wrong if we, if, if we, 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 we follow their teachings? So he said... He said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيينَ Upon you is to follow my sunnah. It's compulsory upon you. When you see all these different factions and this unity, you follow my sunnah, my teachings, my practices. What I have taught you to do, do that. And do what you see my sahabas doing, the four khalifa. أَلْضُوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِزِ be firm. Tamasaku biha. Hold on firm to it. Don't let it go at all. Hold on firm to it. Grip it as if you are gripping it with the jaw teeth as we see. Yeah, because the jaw teeth is the strongest, isn't that so? And when you bite something in the front, it can loose. But when you bite something with the jaw teeth, it doesn't become loose. This is why the Prophet says, bite it firm with the jaw teeth. And then he says, وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And beware of every new thing that is coming on. Many new things will come. This is why there will be disunity. So beware of every new thing that comes. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِرَعَةٍ For every single new thing is an innovation. وَكُلَّ بِرَعَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every sort of innovation leads to the fire of hell. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is clearly telling us. Muslims always are asking. This one is saying that. This one is saying that. Well, forget everybody and follow what the Prophet said. That's the answer, isn't that so? Forget what Tom is saying. Forget what Dick and Harry is saying. Forget everybody and you just follow what the Prophet. That's all. Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, he knew very well. If the Prophet knew everything about the Mahdi. If he knew everything about the Dajjal, the Antichrist, if he knew about the sun rising from the west, which are other points, inshallah, could come about in the future, if he knew all these things, then would he know what will happen to the Ummah? He knows, isn't that so? He knows what will happen to the Ummah. He knows where fitna will come. Sometimes he used to stand and tell the Sahabas, you see from there, fitna will come and will point his hand in the direction. He says, fitna will come there. He told the Sahabas that. He even told them there will be 30 leaders of the Quraysh. 30 leaders came. He says the young boys will rule. Yazid was the first young boy who ruled. In about 60 age. He told us that. Every single thing. So did the Prophet ﷺ not receive knowledge about what will happen? Sure. He says... The other people divided themselves in 72 sects. And my ummah will divide themselves into 73 sects. Kulluhum finnar illa wahida. All of them will go to the fire of hell except one group. One group. So the sahaba says, Ma hiya ya Rasulullah. What is that one group of messenger of Allah? He said, Ma ana alayhi wa ashabi. He says, the group that will go to Jannah, because 70 were heading to, to Jahannam, the fire, and one group alone will go to paradise, Jannah. So everybody like we also would like to know what that group is. So if I give a bayan here, and I didn't tell you when, who is that group, then everybody will say, which is that group? I want to know if I'm there in that group. So the Saham is also like that. O Messenger of Allah, who or what is that group? The Prophet ﷺ says, that group that follows such a path that my teachings are in that path and the teachings of my sahabas are on that path. That is the group. Nothing else. Nothing else. He says, so you have to, in order to be correct, in order to be rightly guided, in order to be on that group that is heading towards paradise, you have to follow the teachings of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we cannot forget the Sahabas because the Sahabas are the ones who sat with the Rasul, who listened to his talk, who did everything he did and followed his footsteps in their life. So we have a pattern that was left for us. Anytime we want to know anything, 
Look at the lives of the Sahabas. What did they do? What did Abu Bakr do? What did Umar do? What did Uthman and Ali radiallahu ta'ala do? He said, Ashabi kan nujum bi ayyihi muqtadaytum ihtadaytum. He says, my companions and Sahabas are like the guidance stars. In the olden days when there was no compass, people used the stars to be guided. They're in the ocean, they will look at the stars. They're in the desert, they look at the stars. They take that as a direction. And it, it gave them good, true direction. So the Prophet says, Mine, Sahabas, are like those guiding stars. If you follow them, whichever one you follow, you will be guided. That's a promise of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was telling us about what he told us. The point was about, he gave us information about what we should do to ensure that we are always guided. To ensure. And he tried, he told us what are those things that could bring destruction. Many things he told us about that will bring destruction. In one beautiful hadith he said, يَمْسَكُ قَوْمٍ مِّنْ أُمَّتِي فِي آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ قِرَدَةً وَخَنَازِيرٍ He said some people they will be disfigured at the end of times and those people will be from mine ummah. Listen carefully to what he say. Some people will be disfigured at the end of times and they will be from mine ummah, mine followers. And they will be disfigured into the shapes of apes and swine. Qiradatan wa khanazir. Apes and swine. Allah will change. They are human beings. Allah will change their shape. Tomorrow they will look like either an ape or a swine, a pig. When the Sahabas heard that, they, they were surprised. Just imagine somebody is telling you some Muslims will be disfigured. And we know what? You know, Islam is the correct religion. It's a true religion. Isn't that so? Once you're Muslim, alhamdulillah, you're unguided. But being disfigured, changing, being changed into a monkey, an ape, being changed into a big or pig or a swine, Say, wow, who are those people? So they said, they were astonished. Because the Prophet said, Min ummati, from mine ummah. From my nation. So for a person to belong to the nation of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa he must believe Allah is one and must accept the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa as the final messenger. That is when he becomes an ummati, a follower. So the Sahaba said, Qalu ya Rasulullah, they said, O messenger of Allah, وَيَشْهَدُونَ أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ And are you telling us that these people believe you are the messenger of Allah and they believe there is no God but Allah? He says, Naam, yes. He didn't stop there. He says, وَيُسَلُونَ They will be performing salat also. وَيَسُمُونَ They will be fasting also. وَيَحُجُّونَ They will be performing hajj also. So it made it more difficult for the Sahabas to understand. Just imagine a Muslim Believes in Allah's one. He believes in the messenger of Allah as the final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is performing salat five times a day, fasting in the month of Ramadan, and he has gone for the hajj and is doing hajj, but yet they will be disfigured and their shapes will be changed into that of apes and, and swines. So they wanted to know, Prophet of Allah. Qalu ya Rasulullah, they said, O messenger of Allah, fama balahum, then what is the matter with them? Why will it happen like that? Listen to the answer of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The answer that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave is a teaching for all of us. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us about anything that brings destruction, it's not just for information. It's that we should take his teaching and save ourselves from destruction. That's why. When he told us about the ways of protecting our iman and safeguarding, safeguarding our Islam, safeguarding our Islam, it's not only for information, it's for us to take those guidelines and practice so that we can protect our iman and our Islam. That's why. That's why he gave these teachings to us. So he said, what will be the reason? He said, first, اتخذوا المعازف One, they will be taken into musical instrument and enjoying music. Ah. They will be behind music. 
They will enjoy music. They will love music. This is what they will do. That's the first point. They will love music. And they will love to look at and see women dancing and singing. They will love that. What takhazul dufuf, and they will love the drums that are being beaten. They will love that. Wa yashrabuna hadhi al-ashriba, and they will be drinking the the what the prohibited and haram drinks. They will be doing that. So what did he say? This is what they will be doing. Music, music is totally haram. All sorts of music, totally haram. There is no allowance for music at all in the Sharia of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith which has been recorded in all the books, Allah has sent me to break up all these musical instruments. That is why I've been sent, to break it up. Allah has sent me to break up the flutes. The Prophet ﷺ was very, very harsh on one occasion. On one occasion during the time of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and it was Abdullah bin Umar. He was passing with his khadim through a place. And uh, when they were passing by, some people were moving with their camels, according to one narration, camels. Now, in the olden days, but even up to now, in places like India, Pakistan, and many different countries like that, even Saudi Arabia, these animals, they have a lot of bells around their necks so that if they are passing, people will hear them, they will take notice, etc. Bells. Those who went for Hajj will see them even at Arafah when all these people are waiting to charge for people for a ride on a camel. All around the neck. Bells. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala passed by that. And as soon as he heard the bells, now how much noise the bell makes? Small little noise, isn't that so? As soon as he heard the bells, he took his fingers, index finger, and he trusted it into his ears. As if he doesn't want to hear anything at all. And he said to his qadim, the one who used to do his khidmat and service, he says, wherever we reach that you cannot hear this anymore, tell me, touch me, so I'll take out my fingers. And he continued to keep it in his ears. Until they reached a little distance. And after that, the qadim touched him and he took it out. He says, oh, Abdullah bin Omar, why did you do that? I've never seen you doing that before. He said, once I was with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this, what I did is what he did, and he told me, and I was the one to touch him. He did that. That is the lesson he taught us. So what is the lesson, Mafum? The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not even tolerate the sound of these bells making noise. What about all these different things people use? What about the things that we have? All these things are haram. Any music, any song, it could be how Islamic. It could be Surah Fatiha. It could be the whole Quran. Once you have music in it, it is totally haram. No scholar has given any allowance for that. Guitars, pianos, even the drums. The drum, a one-sided drum, used to be used at time of wars in the olden days. And they used to use it as a sign when a person became, you know, married. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed the beating of the duff, that's one side of the drum, to hit it only for women on the occasion when there is a marriage and the bride is there. The scholars have made that very clear in their books. There is unanimity upon that. There is no ikhtilaf upon that. So, we can see the destructive nature of that What in this hadith. Eh? The first point the Prophet ﷺ pointed out is that the reason they will be disfigured to change into apes and swine, it takhazul ma'azif, because they will take the musical instruments. That will be their enjoyment. That will be their love. We people listen to it thinking that, you know, it brings a lot of peace and serenity, relaxation. Eh? Allah says in the Quran, Allah Certainly in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find peace and tranquility. But 
The relaxation of shaitan is music. He relaxes with that. He loves that. But a believer relaxes with the tilawat of the Quran, with the dhikr of Allah. The reality is this, my dear respected brothers, many of our Muslims have not grown to love the Quran. Many of our Muslims don't make the dhikr of Allah. They don't sit and say, subhanallah, subhanallah. So that sweetness and, and ecstasy of these words will enter in your heart. So when the love cannot be quenched in the right way, the love will be quenched in the wrong way. Isn't that so? Like if a man cannot get halal money to buy groceries, he will gamble, he will play lotto, he will play with, play, play with, he will go and steal from a person's garden because he has to eat. So if he's not getting it through the halal way, he, he will go in the haram way to get it. So similarly, our heart, the heart is such a thing that it always needs a little peace in it. Sometimes people get out of certain situation, you go for relaxation, isn't that so? It's normal with human beings. So the heart is made up in a way that it, it needs relaxation. It needs peace. It needs to be tranquil at times. So Allah is telling us, what will bring that tranquility to you? What will bring that peace to you? Don't we want to achieve that peace without committing sins? Yes. Allah says, well, do my thicker, call my name, read the Quran, put on a CD with a beautiful reciter. There are thousands, anyone you like, whether it is the imams of the haram, Allah has blessed them, subhanallah. The Quran, whether it is recited, subhanallah, it's so touching. It's recited with so much meaning that tears start to flow from your eyes. Allah has really blessed and put power in the Quran, Allahu Akbar. When you hear these reciters with ikhlas and sincerity, you will realize there is nothing better on the face of the earth than the Quran. And Allah loves, the hadith says, Allah loves to hear the Quran being recited in a sweet manner. Allah loves that. That is beloved to Allah. So therefore we have to get away from that because that music type of thing will take us into a serious destruction. Take us very, very far into the fire of hell. The Prophet says, and people will take taqaynat, dancing woman. Na'uza billah in the world today, singing and dancing woman, that this has become a trend. To the extent that for every advertisement, there is a woman singing something and showing off her body. Whether it's a motor car that people want to advertise, or it's a toothpaste or a toothbrush, don't we look at what happens? For every single, if it's a battery, if it's a torchlight, whatever it is, somebody is there. Why? This is shaitan, Anna. This is why our scholar says, this is the path for the Dajjal. It's been paved. So when the iman of the Muslims are weakened, then when the Dajjal come, he will get a lot of followers because the iman is weak. They wouldn't even be able to recognize the falsehood of the Dajjal. They will think that he's the truth. This is the game shaitan is playing. Weaken your iman. Weaken it. Weaken the iman. So when your leader who is the antichrist come, you will follow him. That is the game shaitan is playing. So therefore, this is what we are seeing. In this satanic environment, in this satanic time that we have come in, this is what has been shown on television. This is what you will see on the front page and the whole the whole Guardian Express is normally filled with all these things around the season. Women, their bodies exposed. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Listen to what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said." He says, "Sanafani min ahl nari lam arahuma." He says, "There are two groups. There are two groups." But before we do this hadith. That just the hadith we were quoting, the Prophet said, so people will take to that. They want to see. Now, sometimes Muslims get caught up also, looking at these things on television. Obviously, they must feel a bit of shame in them when others are sitting. You know, they have their family members. But then, what some Muslims say, no, I just want to see the costume. What is, by, what is the other costume? What is the costume? You want to see the costume? Well, go where they are making and look at the costume itself. <laughs> you know, in order to be logical, if it's only the costume, go where they are making and look at the costume. You don't have to look at, you know, something. <laughs> it's totally haram. These people are actually naked, you know, and 
You are looking now, Zabila, how can people in their correct senses look at these things? Totally haram. This is Qaynat the Prophet is speaking about. Singing, dancing woman, na'uzu billah. May Allah bring an end to these, these, these evils that have dominated the world. Evils. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and people take to these intoxicants. Anything that is intoxicated, people take to it, Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَبَاتُوا They will go to sleep at night. They will be involved in all their things. For example, a Muslim who is like that, what he does? Put on the television, looks at these things late, and then he goes to sleep. Isn't that so? That's the last thing and he goes to sleep. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَبَاتُوا They will go to sleep at night. فَأَصْبَحُوا And when they get up in the morning, they will be disfigured. They wouldn't see the human face in the mirror. They will see either the ape face or the swine face on them. The Prophet says that. That will happen. Things for them will be going good. But then a time will come when they go to sleep and get up in the morning. That will be it. They will be changed totally. Totally into apes and, 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 and swine. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about what we were, we were just indicating to. He said there are two groups. There are two groups from the fire of hell that I have not seen. But they are going to come on the face of the earth. Two groups of people. He says, Qawmun. One group of people, they are those people. Ma'ahum siyatun ka'atna bil baqari. In their hands are something like whips. Resembles the tail of, of, a, of a cow. Referring to what? In their hands shall be weapons. Yadribuna biha an nas. And they will be using these weapons to roam all over the place, killing people. This is one group that will come. And you and I know very well that that is the order of the day, isn't that? So people moving around with weapons. The Prophet wasallam says, a time will come. It will be happening in such a manner la yadil qatilu fi ma qatala wa lal maqtulu fi ma qutila that the murderer would know why he's killing another man and the murdered one would know why he was killed. People are asking the question daily, but what did I do wrong? But they are being killed. A man shoots another one and he doesn't even know the other one. He has never met the other one. So the murderer doesn't even know why he's killing the murdered one. The murdered one doesn't even know why he has been killed. The Prophet says that's a sign of the hour of judgment. The widespread murdering, that's the sign of the hour of judgment as recorded by Imam Bukhari rahman He says, so these people are sign is that they will be moving and roaming about with weapons, shooting and killing. Killing people, beating people. He says, the other group, وَنِسَاءٌ كَاسِيَاتٌ عَارِيَاتٌ مُمِيلَاتٌ مَائِلَاتٌ The other group of people are women. Who consider themselves to be clothed, but yet they will be naked. They will consider themselves to be clothed. In other words, if a woman dresses like that, a Muslim woman, you say, cover yourself. Now they will say, well, I'm covered. <laughs> I say, I'm covered. What's wrong with this clothing? So they will think, the Prophet says, they will think to themselves that they are actually clothed, but ariyatun, they will be naked. The Prophet says, based on what they are wearing. Mumilatun, they will seduce people. They will entice people and attract people towards themselves. And they do it intentionally for that purpose. To put on a manner, to show up a manner, to show their bodies so that they can attract and seduce people and call people and put people. They want to be seen. They want to know that others are looking at them. That is mumilatun, they pull people towards them. Ma'ilatun, they are also attracted to other people, the male. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, رُؤُوسُهُنَّ كَأَسْنِمَةِ الْبُخْتِ الْمَائِلَةِ Their head will be like the hump of camels. He was speaking about the style and the fashion of the day, is that they will comb their hair. They will comb their hair. You know, men have adopted that also. There is a name given to when you, you cut at the side low and on top it's very high. It's haram. Haram. What's the name? Mohawk. Inna lillah. That's a style. Exactly. Look how, look how exact the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was. The woman started to do it first. Cutting hair short and on top it's very high. Like the humps of the camel. 
Now men have adopted that. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, one of the signs of the hour of judgment is men will begin to wear women's clothing and women will begin to wear men's clothing. Another hadith, he says a time will come one of the sign of hour of judgment, a man will marry another man and a woman will marry another woman. Those are the signs of the hour of judgment which we are witnessing our day or time. So he said this group now, this will be the hairstyle, the fashion. He says, لا يدقلنا الجنة These people will never enter paradise. ولا يجدنا ريحها Nor shall they even smell the fragrance of paradise. So my dear respected brothers and my dear sisters, there are two types of the signs of the hour of judgment. One, there are those signs that are right before the destruction of this world. Right before it. Like the coming of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, and uh, the Mahdi, they will, that will occur close. And there are other signs that will come throughout the time. It will come throughout the time. And these are the signs we have been discussing in this program. Those are the signs I said some other time, inshallah, probably another scholar, another lecturer might touch on that topic. But these that we have mentioned is more important to us because whatever has been mentioned, we see it with our own physical eyes. We see what the Prophet is speaking about, has spoken about. Masjids built, big, lofty, empty of musallis, empty of people. People boasting about their masajids. Islam only in name, Quran only in words. We are seeing that. He says, Fahash, Tafahush, the sign of the hour of judgment is indecency, immorality, widespread indecency and indecent behavior. What Tafahush and also what? Indecent speech is tafahush. This is the season we have those two things. Indecent behavior, dress, conduct, and indecent speech. Songs that are being sung. Lyrics of the song, all these things. It's about this, it's about that. Na'uzubillah. Indecent speech. The Prophet ﷺ says, these things will, will happen. Waqatiyatul Raham. He says, another thing that will happen in this hadith, he said, Severing of family ties, a lot of breaking up in the family, a lot of divorce taking place, a lot of problems between children and parents, children not speaking to parents, parents not speaking to children, brothers and sisters not speaking to each other. People have forgotten about family values. He says severing of relationship and breaking of relationship is a sign of the hour of judgment. So my dear respected brothers, my dear sisters, I have spent quite some time here with you and I ask Allah to bless you and to, to give you immense rewards for the patience that you have had and your attentive listening. But it is very important for us to take stock of these things that have been mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. These things have been mentioned so that we can pay heed to what goes on around us. We beg Allah to protect us from all his fitness and mischief. And we beg Allah to protect our entire progeny also. Because it is not only about that we are good Muslims, our children must be good Muslims also. Our grandchildren must be good Muslims also. And as far as it goes, we beg Allah to protect all of them. And we, we must take heed to the, the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Do everything. I urge myself and you. Let us do every such thing that will ensure that our iman is correct and valid. Let us do everything to ensure that our knowledge about our deen is also correct and perfect. And also our practices Stay away, I beg of you, and I remind myself, stay away from all these types of indecency and immorality that has taken the world like a tidal wave in every direction you look. Openly propagated, openly propagated. If any Muslim goes in the open today or any person goes in the open and they start a placard and they start to talk about ban carnival, ban carnival, they will look at you what, as a madman. Eh? Say this man is mad, something is wrong with him. This is what religiousness has reached to. Eh? This is what indecency has reached to on one side. That indecency and immorality is understood as the way of life. And what you are saying of the correct thing, this is looking as it's outdated and backward. This is what has happened to the world today. We ask Allah to protect us. This is staying away, but we must help ourselves stay away from these things. Things that are shown on the media, on the television, stay away. Tell our children to stay away because looking at these things brings destruction to our iman. 
This is slow poison to our Iman. It keeps on decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Probably a person might say, I'm not there, I'm not going, I'm not in all these things. A person might say that, but just the look is totally haram. So we have to protect our gazes, even our thoughts also. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May he guide us all and keep us on the right path. Wal-akhir dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Yeah.